Unit 5b covers phases of matter, temperature, volume, pressure, the ideal gas law, kinetic theory, diffusion, and gas particle diagrams. We begin our discussion of gases by talking about phases of matter. Matter can exist in three different phases, solids, liquids, and gases. Solids have a fixed volume and a fixed shape. That means that no matter what container they're in, they'll always be the same shape and they'll always have the same volume. We can't really compress them or elongate them without changing something about their properties. Liquids have a fixed volume. We can't compress them, but they take on the shape of whatever container they're in. Gases do not have a fixed shape or a fixed volume. So they will take on the volume of their container and the shape of their container. This entire lecture and this whole unit will talk mostly about gases. Before we start talking about gases specifically, let's just cover a few properties that might exist in some type of system of matter. Temperature is a measurement of the thermal energy contained in a system. Temperature is a measurement of the thermal energy of a system. It tells you how hot or cold a system is and it is measured by using a thermometer. The standard units for temperature in physics class is called Kelvin. We aren't actually gonna do any calculations or measurements with the standard unit of temperature that you're used to, like Fahrenheit or Celsius. In physics class, we use a temperature scale called the Kelvin scale, and this is the absolute temperature scale. If you have a system that's at zero Kelvin, we say it's at absolute zero, and that means that there's no thermal energy in your system at all. But you're probably more used to measuring temperature in some more common everyday types of scales like the Fahrenheit scale that we use in America or the Celsius scale that's used in other countries. And you can convert between these temperature scales by using the equations shown below. These formulas will relate Celsius to the Kelvin scale or Fahrenheit to the Kelvin scale. To get to Fahrenheit, you're going to want to convert your temperature in Kelvin to Celsius first and then use this equation here to calculate what temperature is in Fahrenheit. Some common temperatures that you might need to know about are like the freezing point or boiling point of water. Water freezes at zero Celsius or 32 degrees Fahrenheit and it boils at 100 Celsius or 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Volume is another useful property that we can use to describe a system of matter. Volume is the amount of space that a system takes up in three dimensions. It's measured in cubic meters. And different shapes have different formulas that you can use to calculate their volume. But the most common one would be like the volume of a cube, which would have the length times the width times the height. Each of these individual one-dimensional measurements of length, width, and height would be measured in meters, so when you multiply them by each other, you get meters cubed. But you'll also need to know how to calculate the volume of other common shapes like a sphere or a cylinder. And there are also other units that we can use besides meters cubed to describe a system's volume, like liters or cubic centimeters. Now let's start talking more specifically about gases. Gas particles move with random motion. They bumble about throughout a container so that they bump into each other and into the walls of the container. We're gonna talk about ideal gases in this unit, which means that these collisions between the particles in our gas system and the walls of the container are perfectly elastic collisions. And that means that we can use energy conservation and momentum conservation to describe those collisions. And also ideal gases don't consider any type of attraction or repulsion between the individual particles themselves. So if we have collisions in our gas system, that means we can think about each individual particle as obeying momentum conservation like we had in the last unit. Now that we know there are collisions happening between gas particles and the walls of a container, we can describe a property called the pressure of a system. Pressure is a measurement of the amount of force exerted over an area. So every time one of those little gas particles crashes into the wall of a container, it will exert a force because it's changing its momentum. It, it has an impulse. And that force is exerted over the area of the wall of our container. And this gives rise to what we know as pressure. The standard unit for pressure is called a Pascal. And a Pascal has units hidden away inside of it which are a Newton divided by a meter squared. So the pressure is a force exerted over an area. But we could also use other common units like pounds per square inch or PSI, like your tires in your car are measured in, 
or atmospheres like the pressure that we live in every day in our atmosphere or other common units like tor or millimeters of mercury which is what you use to measure your blood pressure and again this pressure comes about because of these collisions between the gas particles and the wall of the container that is holding those gas particles so like in the tire of your car where you put gas particles into your tire you put air in those gas particles will crash up against the inside wall of your tire and that's what gives rise to this pressure now we can use the ideal gas law to relate all of these properties in a gas system to each other in physics class the ideal gas law says pv equals nkt where p is the pressure v is the volume n is the number of particles in your system kb is a constant known as the Boltzmann constant, which is given here, 1.38 times 10 to the negative 23 joules per Kelvin, and T is the temperature of your system measured in Kelvin. Perhaps you've seen the ideal gas law in your chemistry class before, and they look at it from a slightly different lens. The chemistry version of the ideal gas law says PV equals NRT, where this lowercase n is the number of moles of your gas particles, and R is the ideal gas constant 8.314 joules per mole kelvin we're not going to end up using this pv equals nrt very much we're going to stick with the physics version but if you ever need to use the chemistry version the number of moles of gas that you have is just related to how many particles you actually have in your system through something known as avogadro's number avogadro's number relates the number of particles in your system to the number of moles in your system by this relationship right here. And Avogadro's number is 6.022 times 10 to the 23 particles per mole. But again, we're mostly gonna stick with this version of the ideal gas law shown at the top. And the ideal gas law can be used to help us understand why pressure changes for different volumes or different temperatures or a different amount of gas in your system. So one really easy example to think about is the pressure in a tire of like a bicycle or your car. At first, your tire might be relatively flat. That means it has a very low pressure and you could hook up a pressure gauge to read out this pressure. And if we put more air in, like you have to fill up your flat tire, you go to the gas station and put some air in, that will eventually lead to the pressure increasing and your tire ending up more inflated. If we add even more air once the tire is back to its original shape, then the pressure inside of your tire increases even more. And then if the temperature increases, you'll also see that the pressure will increase owing to this relationship in the ideal gas law. And you can see that the pressure would increase even more, which is why when you fill up your tires in your car, if you're driving in the winter time, the pressure of your tires might go down because the temperature is going down. The baseline temperature and pressure that we live at every day is known as standard temperature and pressure. This, doesn't, this isn't actually room temperature, but it is what we relate a lot of these measurements to. So standard temperature is going to have zero degrees Celsius or 273 Kelvin. Standard pressure is one atmosphere. That's the amount of pressure that we feel every day, which is actually 101 1325 pascals and the volume of an ideal gas at standard temperature and pressure is 22.4 liters for every mole so you might need to convert this to meters cubed and if you relate it to the number of particles in your system we would say that the standard volume for one mole of gas is 22.4 liters for every 6.022 times 10 to the 23 particles that's a lot of particles by the way since these particles in a gas are moving with a velocity or a speed they have kinetic energy and kinetic theory is a way that we relate the energy to our gas system the kinetic energy for a system is normally one half mv squared but since we have a lot of particles with a lot of different velocities we just end up calculating the average kinetic energy for the whole system of gas particles and that kinetic energy is related to one half the mass of our gas particles times the average velocity of all of these gas particles combined. This kinetic energy is related to the thermal energy in your system. It says that the average kinetic energy is related to the thermal energy by this relationship. The average energy is three halves 
the Boltzmann constant times the temperature that you're at. So in other words, the higher the temperature is, the faster your gas particles will be moving and the more energy there is in a gas system. Another important idea for gas particles is an idea called diffusion, which talks about the motion of gas particles throughout a system. Diffusion is the movement of substances due to random thermal motion. So since these objects have a temperature, they're moving with a velocity and that means that they will be moving about in some random direction. Sort of like the path that's shown here for this particle. It starts over here and then maybe it bumps into something and changes its path and eventually after some amount of time it will bumble about and end at this point. And we can say that the distance that this particle traveled from start to end is a distance that we'll call x for now. This x is known as the root mean square distance of the gas particle. It's sort of like an average distance that is covered by a gas particle in some given amount of time. And the longer that we let a particle diffuse, the farther we would expect for it to travel. And this diffusion, this motion of particles also depends on something known as the diffusion coefficient, which is related to the specific gas that you're looking at and other properties of the system. And so the equations for the distance that we expect a particle to travel over some given amount of time is shown here in these three different relationships. The first one is for one dimensional motion. If we're just talking about random motion along a single line, then we would use this top equation. But if we're talking about two dimensional motion, sort of like what you see on this slide right here, this particle is only moving in two dimensions, X and Y, then we would use this middle equation. And if we think about three dimensions, then we would use the bottom equation. The diffusion coefficient has units of meters squared per second. And it depends on what particles are diffusing. The bigger the particle is, the slower it will diffuse. And there's also other properties that affect the diffusion coefficient. And if you ever need to calculate it, you could use this equation at the bottom, but we won't end up talking about that very much in this class. So when we're talking about diffusion, we're talking about why gas particles move throughout some system. So you could imagine that I spray a little bit of perfume or cologne on one end of a room. And over time, those gas particles would diffuse throughout the room and end up on the other side of the room. That's what diffusion is. It's a gas moving from one place to another due to the random motion of these gas particles. Our diagrammatic model for this unit is called a gas particle diagram, which represents all of the relevant properties of a gas as seen in the ideal gas law. So the way that you create this is first you draw a box to represent your container. The size of this box is relative to the volume of your system. So a bigger box means that you have a bigger volume in your container. Then you draw dots inside of the container which represent the number of gas particles in your system. The more particles that we draw, that means that we have more particles contained within the container. And since these particles are moving, we'll represent their motion with arrows coming from each dot. And these arrows should represent the velocity or speed of the gas particles. So a longer arrow represents a faster speed. And as we know from kinetic theory, the speed of a gas particle is related to its temperature. So the higher the temperature is in your gas system, the longer these arrows should be. And lastly, the pressure in a gas is related to how many collisions there are between the gas particles and the walls of the container. So there should be some of these gas particles that collide with the wall of the container and bounce off. They reflect back in a different direction than where they came and the number of collisions represents the pressure in the system. So the higher the pressure is, the more collisions we need to draw between the particles and the walls of the container. So to sum up all of this information, you wanna include some notes at the bottom below your gas particle diagram to give some quantitative information for what you're trying to represent. Here I've just provided some random numbers. Um, in this system, I have a volume of 0 0.001 meters cubed or one liter. I have 10 particles drawn. Of course, we can't draw 10 to the 23 particles. That would be more than billions and billions and billions of particles. So you can just pick a number that seems reasonable. Usually 10 or maybe 15 dots would be fine for most systems. And then if you remove gas by sucking it out with a vacuum, or if you add more gas in by using a, a ball pump in a volleyball or something like that, then you would 
put more dots to represent more number of particles. I have shown that the temperature is 300 Kelvin. That's right around room temperature for most gas systems. So the higher that this temperature is, the longer these arrows would be. And I wanna make sure I list how many collisions that I'm actually showing in this example so that if we change the pressure, we can either decrease or increase the number of collisions with the walls. Here you can see that I've shown five collisions, one, two, three, four, five, between the gas particles and the walls of the container. So that'll cover everything for unit 5B. I'll see you in the next one.